Um, a few months back, I started doing a new series of just every now and then. Um, I like to put together, I call, it the, I call it anatomic Bible study, and it's where we go scripture by scripture, line upon line, and we need to do that sometimes. Um, sometimes like, you know, Pastor Troy, you, you preach topically. Yeah, because I actually want you to live a victorious life. That's exactly right. I learned the Bible topically. So like, well, I don't know if I like that or not. Well, if you want to apply it to your life, you need to know it topically. If you have to stand against a demon here in the next few minutes, do you know what the Bible says about that? If, uh, if you need to repair your marriage, do you know what the Bible says about that? If you need to be healed, do you know what the Bible says about that? So topically is very important to learn the word of God. But there's a problem with that. And the problem with that is that you miss so much of the field when you just go to one little piece of the, of the acre or the 100 acres and say, I'm just going to dig right here. And sometimes, man, you just got to plow through the entire thing. And the kingdom of heaven is like a man who finds a treasure hidden in the field. And for the joy thereof, he goes and sells all that he has and he buys that field. It's like, man, there's such a treasure in the field. So friends, if you would, open up your Bibles to John chapter 1. John chapter 1 is where we're at. John chapter 1. Now, I love the book of John. The book of John is a masterpiece. There's so much in it. And we're going to look at verse by verse, and we're going to go through this. And guys, if you don't know any other book, as far as the Gospels go, you should know the book of John. And one of the things I like to tell people, like in prisons, if they say, man, I want to know this Bible and I don't know where to start, I say, read the red letters in the book of John. Read what Jesus says in the book of John and start there. And they're like, well, well why, why would you do that? Because the book of John is really special. Not that the other gospels are not really special, but even how it starts out is very much like Moses. And like, well, why would it, why would it start out like that? Because in the book of Matthew, uh, Matthew wants you to know that he is the promised Messiah and that he is the king. And in the book of Mark, Mark wants you to know that he's a burden bearer and he's the greatest servant that has ever lived. In the book of Luke, the Luke, one, Luke wants you to know that he was a human being. He was not God pretending to be a human being, but he was God Almighty who did become a human being. And all of his humanity is expressed in the book of Luke. But John just said he's straight up God. That's who Jesus is. I mean, he is God. Like what? And yeah, that's who he was to John. And John knew him in his humanity. And John knew him, but John had also been called up into a high place and had seen something that nobody else has seen. And so that's the four faces of the cherubim, right guys? The face of a lion, that's Matthew. The face of an ox, the burden bearer, that's Mark. The face of a man, that is Luke. And the face of an eagle, the supernatural side of God, John. Everybody go, ta-da! Yeah, we haven't even read a verse yet. John is amazing. The book of John is incredible, and I'm so grateful for it. It's, it's very much unlike the other three Gospels. I mean, it's different. And there are stories that are in the book of John that are not in the other three Gospels, and there's stuff in the, book of, in, the, in the other three Gospels that John doesn't make a big deal out of. John saw a need to write this book. Now, it is this same John who wrote the book of Revelation. You guys remember that cat, right? That brother was called up in Revelation chapter four. The first thing that he did was, was that he saw Jesus. The first reason he qualified for it was because he was literally on an island and the island was literally a place of captivity. And I've been to that island. It's called Patmos. It's a Greek island. And uh, it was also a blind colony. So what the Romans did was they poked your eyes out when they kept you there and you didn't ever leave because who else is gonna take care of blind people but blind people? So unless John is the exception to that rule, and I bet he's not, everything he saw in the book of Revelation, he saw without eyeballs within his head. Now, that's speculation on my part, but it's also historical proof that the island of Patmos was not only a prison, but how they kept them captive is they knocked their eyes out. And that sounds like a Roman to me, by the way. So whenever it says, and I turned to see the voice, I think that's the first time he had seen anything in a long, long time. And he saw with an eye that you can't imagine. 
But in Revelation chapter, in Revelation chapter two, and then also in chapter three, he gives these seven epistles of Jesus to the church. And you and I make a big deal out of the epistles of Paul and the epistles of John. We make a big deal out of the epistle of Jude. We make the, we make a really big deal out of the epistles of Peter. But do we make a big deal out of the epistles of Jesus? Like what are the epistles of King Jesus? What in the world is a daggum epistle? What is that? It is a letter that is written to somebody that is meant to be used as curriculum. Okay, it's like, okay, here's a letter. I'm just a dude, but I'm writing a letter, but I know that you're gonna read it to the entire church. And you have a herald, both in the spirit and also in the natural, and we're just gonna call him the angel. So unto the angel of Ephesus, right. Unto the angel of this. So the herald in the spirit and the herald are the guy who is, or the guy who is responsible for reading the letter to the church. Jesus specifically sent a word to all seven churches and said, get your act together. Uh, I had an interesting question today on the prophetic life. And each, I, we do the prophetic life on Tuesdays and Wednesdays and people join us from 40 different nations across the world and they ask me questions. And I love question and answer time. I, it's like one of my favorite things in the whole world is question and answer time. I just love that. And whenever we do this thing, this person asked me today who is, uh, he's in another nation and he says, man, I just don't know how to, uh, I don't know how to walk in the heart of King Jesus and I don't know how also, how I can support Israel in going against Hamas when I'm in the heart of King Jesus. I'm like, see, the problem that you have is you think that Jesus is now the way he was in his earthly ministry. If you wanna know what Jesus is like now, look in the book of Revelation. And Jesus has no problem wiping Hamas off the planet Earth. No problem whatsoever. I'm talking about wiping them out. And it's like, man, dude, you, listen, you, you don't know what you're talking about. Like, I, he's like, yeah, well, whenever Jesus came the first time, it was to make friends with human beings and to deliver the face of God Almighty to humanity so that we didn't, so that we wouldn't be unaware of what the heart of God was all about and what God actually looked like. But when he comes a second time, he's not coming back to make friends. He's already made friends. And he's coming back to defend us and to, and to specifically defend Israel. And he's not here to make friends. He doesn't care if he's anybody else's friends. He doesn't care. He's like, I can't die for you any more than I died. I can't live for you any more than I lived. I can't resurrect any more than I resurrected. There's nothing else I have for you. Either love me or not. Because I'm not playing games. That's Jesus in the book of Revelation. And that, my friend, is the revelation of who? Jesus Christ. And when he shows up in the Gospels, it's not the revelation of Jesus, it's the revelation of God the Father through Jesus. But when Jesus shows up in the book of Revelation, it is the revelation of Jesus. So, John knew all that. So John writes a different, a very different kind of book. And he writes this book. And he says in verse one, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. I just had a brilliant idea. Did y'all hear that? Oh, it's my computer. Let me turn that sound thing off, that little doohickey here. I don't know how to, okay. So he starts off and he writes his book and he starts off the way that Moses starts off the Torah in the beginning, in the beginning. The, the Hebrew word for that is bereshit. And that is a very prophetic word. And it's a messianic word. And so John's like, okay, I'm gonna bring it to you the way that Moses brought it. I don't know if you've ever thought about in this form, because see, whenever I think about John, the problem that I have is I tend to think about the John of the Gospels. And the John of the Gospels is kind of needy. He really doesn't talk. He only talks unless his brother talks. And then he just says whatever his brother says. He's always hanging out with the girls. Uh, he doesn't hang out with the dudes. He hangs out with the women. Um, he's following along when, when, G when Jesus is having a very manly discussion with Brother Peter, which is actually about how he's going to die and how to do it right. That's pretty serious talk to have. 
He's so close walking behind going, oh, I want to hear, I want to hear, I want to hear. He gets on Peter's nerves and Peter's like, when is this dude going to die? That's in the Bible. That's the true story. He's like, can we talk about his death? Because I haven't heard you mention his death. And then Jesus said, well, what is it to you if I want him to live forever? And Peter's response was, no! So he got on everybody's nerves. Let me ask you this. Would this get on your nerves? You're at the Last Supper with King Jesus. And the brother is sitting next to Jesus. It is the Last Supper. It's a big deal. And Jesus is trying to eat and conduct the Passover Seder. And the brother has his head on the chest of Jesus. I'd have killed him. I, I, I'd, have, I'd have knocked him out. I'd have, I have no patience for clingy people. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Man, but I'd have been so wrong because he turns out to be the baddest motor scooter out of all of the disciples. He turns out to be the one. I'm talking about. Now, he took a while for him to develop there. <laughs> it was a process. But he turns out to be the most awesome of all the disciples. He's incredible. Mm. Whenever I was, whenever I first read this and was looking at this, have you ever thought about this son of thunder? And he starts off first one, and it is just, he does this with the subtlety of a meat cleaver. And we learn that God showed up as a man, and his name is Jesus, and Jesus is God, and he was there before he arrived. Yeah, he was there before he arrived. Okay, what? And he writes it like Moses. Okay, let's compare Moses and John together because both of them are incredibly meek. In fact, the Bible says that Moses is the meekest man on all the planet Earth, right? Right? Well, he was incredibly meek, John was. Here's another one too. They both have brothers that speak for them. All right? Anytime in the Bible where it's talking about and John said, it always says, and James and John said. Because James was such a little sniveling, I'm sorry, not James, but John was such a sniveling little clingy person that his brother would say, well, I don't think that's right. And he would say, yeah, I don't think that's right. And if James said, hey, I think we ought to do this, he said, yeah, I think we ought to do this. He had no voice of his own when he was young because James was the dude. And I can't imagine how devastated they all were when James was the first one to be killed out of all, out of, all of the disciples. Like, no, he's the one that's going to carry the church into the next place. I mean, he's James. He's James. Well, then it's got to be Peter. And then what happened when Peter died? Well, then it's got to be Philip. Well, what happened when Philip died? Well, it's got to be Thomas. I mean, he's so on fire for the Lord now. And it all falls down to John. Who was the one that took care of Jesus' mama? Honor your father and mother that your days be long up on the earth. What did Jesus say to John? My mother is your mother now. You remember that? I don't know that we're going to get past this first verse, y'all. <laughs> Because there's so much in this first verse. It's so, it's so incredible. Here's something else too. They both have very unique relationships with God. They both had great revelation from a high up place where they were personally and supernaturally invited to, right? They both write down their revelation and they deliver the word back to God's people. And so he kind of has this mosaic anointing on him. And so he starts off his book the way that Moses started off the Torah in the beginning. How the Bible starts off, this, this Hebrew word bear sheet is so crazy cool. But in, in the Torah, it is in the beginning God. And that's the first four words of the Torah, correct? Okay, if you go to the end of the book of Genesis, it's talking about Joseph dies. And the last four words of the book of Genesis are a coffin in Egypt. You go from in the beginning God to a coffin in Egypt. You go from the greatest thing that you can possibly imagine to the most horrible thing you can possibly imagine. That's how the book of Genesis go. You know who entered into that picture? We did. Amen. But in the New Testament, when we start off with the, 
when we start off with the book of Matthew and like, okay, how does Matthew, so, so wait, stop. How does, let's just continue talking about the, how the Old Testament ends because at the end of the book of Malachi, it ends like this. I will, send the, I will send you Elijah the prophet and he shall turn the hearts of the fathers towards the children and the hearts of the children towards the fathers lest I smite the earth with a curse and the Bible is over. The Old Testament, the last word of the Old Testament is the word curse. When you make God so mad, he says a cuss word, you made him mad. The very last word of the Old Testament is curse. Like, what? Yeah. Then you go over to the New Testament and he answer the book of Revelation that this cat wrote, which is John, and the last words of the New Testament are, now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Okay, so it goes from a curse to a blessing. Guess who entered into that picture? Jesus did. Isn't it amazing how the word of God is written and how it's built and how it's constructed. We cannot get through life without studying this. Amen. We have to know this. It's great to know the lineup. It's great to know the lineup. It's great to know everybody's batting averages. It's great. But if you know that and don't know this, you're missing it. Amen. Know the word of God. Study the word of God. Fall in love with Jesus and say, King Jesus, I want to find you in the scriptures. I find Jesus in the scriptures of how it's just written. And, and, and since I'm not educated, I can get away with it. Isn't that great? I'm so glad God didn't let me go to college, man. So <laughs> in the beginning. So here's something else, too, that I, I, I love about this. He says this, in the beginning, he says, was the word. Wow. And the word was with God, and the word was God. And this is very interesting to me because one of the things that I find in this is that Jesus does not understand your wanting to be alone time because he does not want to be alone. The word of God says that at, at the birth of creation, he was with God. That's what, the word of, that's what the word of God says. Now, everything he does is for you to be with him. And when he was in human form, he was called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Jesus is coming back soon, friends. And when he comes back, you're like, well, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm scared. I don't know. Here's all you need to know. Because they asked Jesus, why, why are you going away to prepare a place for us and then you're coming back? He said, so that where I am, you may also be. Hallelujah. He loves you. He wants to be with you. He doesn't hate your humanity. He thinks you're cool. He thinks you're worth dying for. He thinks that you're worth living for. He thinks you are awesome. He thinks about you all the time. Like, well, I don't think he does. Uh, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think he does that. No, no, you don't do that. And you think God is like you and he's not. He tells you what he's like. The Word of God tells us what God is like. Amen. And this is what he says he is like. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, I love that. Man, I tell you what, we have to learn to study the things that God loves and, 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 and love the things that God loves, and we have to hate what God hates. And I want to tell you something that God hates. He hates, he hates loneliness. He also hates barrenness. He also hates shame. Oh, come on. There's a bunch of things. You know, there's eight things that the Bible says that God hates, right? Seven things are abomination of God. These things the Lord hates, and yea, eight. And every single one of them is a description of Judas Iscariot. Look at all of them. A haughty look, feet that run swiftly to divide the brethren, right? Every single one of those things is a perfect description of Judas, and it says, hands that shed innocent blood. Do you know what the last recorded words of Judas are in the Bible? I have shed the innocent blood. And then there's no more recording of anything he ever said. God just wanted it up on record that he falls in the category of things God hates. Everybody say, yikes. Yeah. Well, guys, we need to learn how to, how to love what God loves and hate what God hates. And you and I should hate it when someone is alone, when someone is lonely, when someone doesn't have a voice, when someone doesn't have anybody in the world that sees them. The Lord sees them. One of the prophetic words that I tell uh, little girls all over the planet, all over the planet Earth is this. Are you ready for this? Because it's really not that profound, but it changes girls' lives. Is this, you are a good girl. 
just to look into the eyes of a girl that's been a slave her entire life and tell her, I see you and you're a good girl. Like, why would you do that? Because that's what Jesus would do. I know what Jesus would do. And I just love him so much. I'm just so grateful. Thank you. So, Dios te bendiga. Amen. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then this, and he was in the beginning with God. There it is again. Right? So the point of all that is, listen, he's before time, but you need to know he's never been alone. Because he is God, and he was with God at the same time. That's a unique and awesome relationship. And then verse three says, right? The, ver the verse three says, all things were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made. All right, get ready for this because John lets you know, Jesus is creator God. And a lot of people don't know that. And John wants you to know, by, I'm talking about three verses in to his amazing book, he wants you to know, Jesus is creator God. The Father is not creator God. Jesus is creator God. It's like, whoa, 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 I didn't know that. Oh yeah, everything that was made was made by him. He is the word. And so the creative side of God or the creator side of God is actually Jesus. And that's why he became the creation of God. Amen, he became a human being. And everything that you see that has ever been made, that was, in, that was in the heart of Jesus to make those things. It's incredible, isn't it? Jesus is the creator. Jesus is the part of God that expresses all things creative. John 1.10, he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. It, it blew John's mind. And he'll say this in just a few more verses. It blew John's mind that he created the world and the world didn't know who he was. Have you ever thought about Jesus being creator God? And, and does that change things for you? Because it changed things for me, man. When I first got this, I was like, okay, I'm always thinking of, of Jesus as the one who can relate to me because he became a human being and he loves me and he understands my humanity. Yeah, 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 yes, absolutely. But know this too. He loves you, he can relate to you, but there ain't nothing he can't do. There ain't nothing he can't make happen for you. He literally created the universe out of nothing because he simply wanted to. I mean, that gummit, doesn't that make you wanna know him better? Like, man, I mean, like, man, I want to know, I want to know Bruce Wayne. I want to know this cat. I want to know that cat. These, these cats got money. They got resources. They got means. They got something awesome. Dude, get to know Jesus. He is literally creator God. Man, that is powerful to me. Jesus is our creator. Creativity comes from Jesus. Religion, the devil, and the controlling nature of our flesh will always hate creative expressives. Always. And man, I want to just, here's, here's how you know when it's real. This is how you know when it's real. When, when it's all a little bit different. When there's a whole lot of variance. Let me tell you how you know when it's fake. Everybody looks the same, acts the same, talks the same, has exactly the same haircut, wears exactly the same, wears exactly the same clothes. Everybody has to be the same. And there's this, there is no creative expression among us whatsoever. You know, I mentioned last week when I was going off on angels, demons, the Nephilim, and the days of Noah. That was a cool message, by the way. I like that message. I love that whole paradigm. It blows my mind. And, and I was... I was, that was like the, the, the mild version of it too. I've got some wild stuff out there. But you know, I was talking about, look, if you want to know about all this craziness that's going on today and why are people seeing all these things, why are these face peelers showing up in Peru? Why is this happening? Why is that happening? Why is this happening? All that. You need to know this. See, you have been taught that within the spirit, there's only two species, angels and demons. And that is so, that, that's crazy. Because if there's 50 million species on this planet Earth, and there are, imagine how many species of spiritual beings that there are inside the heavenly realm or the spirit. 
And I, I went through 10 different kinds of biblical angels. Like those are 10 species of angels. And there are some angels and some angels that have fallen that are so close to our own DNA that we can actually reproduce. You can't even do that, you know, with a donkey and a horse. What happens after that is sterile. A donkey is sterile. It's like, okay. Like, oh, see, that's the rule. Things have to reproduce according to their kind. And so, man, if there is a physicality to some groups of angels that is so physical and so real that their DNA is so close to us that we can reproduce, I don't think that we think like that in the Western world. We think of little fat white babies with angels, with angels' wings, or we think of a big giant dude with a sword. And that's what we think. Dude, heaven is so populated with so many kinds of spiritual things. Amen. And you know who created them all? Jesus. He's the creator. Man, I love him. I just think he's crazy cool. Well, um, it, it, so look here. You look at any demonic, like a socialist nation, or you go to a socialist nation, or you go to a communist nation, and I've been, I've been in the underground church, all those places. And you know what you see? Where, there, where there's that kind of control, everything is gray, everything is boring. They glorify systems instead of freedom, right? And that's, that's, not, how, that's not how Jesus creates things. How Jesus creates things tells you he wants you to run wild and he wants you to have fun. And he's going to trust you with it. Mm, I love me some King Jesus. So do you know that about Jesus, that he was a builder of universes before he was a carpenter in Israel? The creator is who he continues to be. Verse three, all things are made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made. Verse four, and in him was life. And that life was the light of men, and that light shines into the darkness, and the darkness comprehends it not. That means the darkness does not compete with it. It's no competition. It's not a competition between light and darkness. It's like, okay, he literally interrupts darkness. That's what he does. And the darkness doesn't know how to deal with it. There's nothing it can do about it. The physics of light are way superior than the physics of darkness. The darkness is just where there is nothing, right? It's void. And so, yeah, so the Lord shows up and he does that. And, and if, if this was the PTV or the Pastor Troy version of the Bible, and if I translated that, how I would translate that was this, in him was life and the life was the light of men. And that light shines into the darkness. Wait, the darkness in what? In men. He's already told you that he was the light that was spoke into the darkness of all the creative universe. Now he's saying he is also the light that is spoken, is, that is spoken into the darkness of mankind. And then it says this, and that darkness is no competitor. Come on. That's the word of God. Dude, we're just in four verses of the book of John. It's crazy. I... I the whole thing of Jesus being the light. So Psalms 119, verse 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. John chapter eight, verse 12, then Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world and he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Darkness is no competition, is no match for light. John 1, 5, the light shines in the darkness. Darkness does not comprehend it. To walk in the light is a relational journey with God and with each other. So when you and I walk in the light, it has to do with we are walking and living together according to our relationship with God. So friends, walk in the light. Amen. Don't be a racist pig. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Um, don't be uh, sexual around women. Leave them alone. Listen, if you're burning up and if you're a hunk of hunk of burning love, you need to get married. That's what Paul said. He said it's better than burning. 
That's what Paul said. It's better than burning. I was like, I don't know that that's a good excuse to get married, Paul. He's like, no, it, no, it's better than burning. Well, that's <laughs> strange, Paul. Walk in a light. Walk and live with people according to your relationship with God and let people see something very different in you than what they see in this ugly old world. Because darkness is no competition to the light. None whatsoever. Okay, so then he says this. Now we're going to switch a little bit. So the first five verses, we actually talk about Jesus. And he says, let me introduce you to Jesus. He's God. He is the creator. And he loves to interrupt darkness. And he did that with the universe to start off with. And now he's doing it with men. And I'm going to tell you how. Now, but let's talk about John. Because John is this weirdo dude that wears uh, camel skin, which is horrible. I want y'all to think about camel, about camel skin for a minute. How many of you guys know, how many of you guys know that have a camel skin trophy on their wall? Nobody on the history of the planet Earth has ever done that because it's butt ugly. You can come to my house, I will show you bear. I have bears. I have all kinds of craziness, right on. But I don't have a camel. I don't have that. Like, why would you be wearing camel skin? Why would you do that? Because he's a testimony. Everything he does is a testimony of King Jesus. And he's like, the one that comes behind me will bear your burdens of sin. Because that's what a camel is all about. It's about burden bearing. And then he also walks around and the brother has a strange diet. He eats honey, which is cool, and locusts. Now I want to tell you, your pastor has eaten locusts on several occasions. And like, why would you do that? Because it's awesome. Now, let me tell you about locust eating. Uh, one of the first times I was ever in Uganda, East Africa, we were driving and we're driving along and me and Leanna's talking and we're shooting a bull and we got this cool driver and you know, we're gang, 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 we're moving along, gang, gang, gang. And I see this black cloud and I'm like, oh, looks like a storm is coming. And he goes, my God, these are the locusts. I'm like, that's, that's locusts? You have got to be kidding me. And he said, no. And he said, what's cool is it looks like it's going to miss us. I don't know. It's about 10 miles off. And I said, no, no, no. We have to drive into the locust cloud. Where am I ever in my life going to get another opportunity to fly into a locust cloud? And I was young. And I'm like, Leanna, we're going to fly into the locust cloud. She's like, okay. And we did. And dude, it was... <laughs> It was so awesome. Okay, so locusts to me are the things that make the noise in the trees down here, right? Oh, those are actually called? Yeah, that's right. The thing that goes in the trees, right? I always thought that was a locust, the big green bug that you can scare your sisters with. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about, right? You can chase them with that. And it's, it's, it's like a joy buzzer in your hand when you shake your hands, like, and they freak out. Okay, that's what I thought, because we, we call that locust in Texas. That ain't what a locust is. A locust is a grasshopper. And I'm talking about big old, big old grasshoppers. I mean, a regular grasshopper. Like, you know, a grasshopper. But there's billions of them. And I mean, it is a giant cloud of billions and billions and billions of carnivorous locusts. And so when you go into a village and the locusts are first coming, it's a lot like a hell storm. It's like, okay, it's like gang, 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 Everybody was putting out these big metal things, like, you know, like what you carry milk in, those kind of metal, those kind of metal jugs. And then they had a metal sheet that they curled up and they put it down on top of the thing so that it kind of funneled. And then uh, we sit there and we let the cloud of locusts. It took about 20 minutes for the, for the locust cloud to get past us. And it was crazy. And I'm telling you, man, there was a green thing left. I mean, it, 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 it's so cool. And we're just like, wow. And uh, they leave, and 
I get out and all those people come out and they start putting lids on those things and they caught all those locusts because, man, we're going to eat locusts now. And I asked them, I said, what are they, what are they doing? And they're like, oh yeah, well, they're going to eat that. And I'm like, oh, just turn the car off. <laughs> I got I to gotta see this, man. This can be amazing. Well, let me tell you what a locust tastes like. A locust tastes like anything you cook it in. Because by the time you fry it, all the guts have been cooked out of it, and it's just a crunchy shell, and it's like a potato chip. You just take the legs off of it, and that's what you do. It's fun to do that with the folk in the village, though, man. And you get out there in your cowboy hat and eat locusts with them, I'm telling you right now, that is a good time. And those people think it is so cool that you stop to eat locusts with them. And it's fun, man. Kids are playing, Leanna's playing with the kids, and gosh, it was just a great day. But that's not what John did. What John did was he ate locusts, and he also ate honey. It was a prophetic picture that he had honey, which is life and the promises of God, in his mouth, and he also had locusts, which is a curse in his mouth. And it was a testimony of the one that was coming after him that his word would be life unto some and death unto, and death unto others. He was like, okay, I know that Jesus is gonna come looking like the Father. I need to come looking like Jesus in a really strange kind of way. And he did. Uh, I love what, I love his testimony of John where he says there was a man that was sent from God whose name was John. Now John is a name that means grace and what a great prophetic name given to the messianic forerunner, that his name is literally Grace. All right, when John shows up on the scene, and John, of course, is the cousin of King Jesus, one of the things that's interesting about John is that John's dad had been the high priest. Now, he was thrown out, and when he was thrown out, a, a corrupt bunch came in, and this father-son-in-law team came in, and the two of those cats became the high priest, and it was a completely corrupt system. But here's the deal. John, John the Baptist should have been the high priest. He should have been. He was, he, as far as God was concerned, he was indeed the high priest. Now, the Bible gives the bloodline of King Jesus, and King Jesus should have been the king of Israel. Not Herod, who was an Edomite. He wasn't, you know, he's an Edomite, which means he's a descendant of Esau, which means he has a Nephilim gene pool in him. He's a bad guy. That's why he kills babies and builds cities. That's what they all do. Amen. So he's got a Nephilim, he comes from the Nephilim gene pool, and he's demonic, and uh, he's a bad cat. But Jesus was the true king of Israel. John was the true high priest of Israel. So when John anointed Jesus, he was passing on his priestly anointing unto King Jesus so that Jesus would be a priest and a king. That's why Jesus said, no, man, you got to baptize me. That's what you had. Isn't that great? By the way, isn't that just one of the greatest things? So John is mentioned 19 times in the Gospels, and 19 is a number associated with great faith. And uh, Ed Vallow, who has a book called Biblical Mathematics, I think it's better than my book. I love the book, Biblical uh, Mathematics. Um, I just discovered it just a few years ago, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so good. And uh, he's a Baptist pastor out of Arkansas, and I follow him and study his stuff. He points out that in Hebrews chapter 11, gives a list of 19 people in the Hall of Fame of Faith. I've pointed that out as well. But John is mentioned 19 times, so he's part of the Hall of Fame of Faith. And that's what 19 tends to represent. It means exploits of faith, great faith. John is a bridge between the Old and the New Testament. Uh, seven centuries before the birth of Jesus, the prophet Isaiah spoke of the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, Isaiah prophesied that he would prepare the way of the Lord or make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So John is the personification of that scripture. So John goes to the wilderness and Jesus goes to the temple. Amen. Are y'all with me? So it also says in Luke chapter uh, 1, verse 17, that he will also go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient of the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. This description 
of John means why. Okay, when he comes in the spirit of Elijah, one of the layers of revelation of him coming in the spirit of Elijah is this. He's passing off a mantle. Okay, that's what Elijah did. He passed off a mantle to Elisha, right? The spirit of Elijah, and that's why it says, okay, this one will come in the spirit of Elijah, and he has to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the hearts of the children of the fathers, and it literally means to pass down a mantle. You guys understand that prophetic language? Okay, that's what he did with the royal priesthood. He passed it down to, to King Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? I just think that that's amazing. I, I can't tell you how much that that has meant to me through the years. John was mostly a rude dude in a crude mood. And in my observation, he was not a people person. And so he was not found with people like Jesus would be. He was sent to be a witness. And if you are a witness, you have to be separated and divided from people. Amen. So... Um, Jesus says in Matthew eleven eight, for John came neither eating or drinking, and they say that he had a demon. Eating or drinking means uh, socializing. He said he didn't socialize with anybody, and you guys said he's demon possessed. That's why he lives out there in the wilderness, right? So that's him. Here's the deal: John did not seek out multitudes. Multitudes sought out John. I love John. Don't you just love John the Baptist? Don't you love how politically incorrect he is? Am I the only person in here that loves how politically incorrect he is? You know, the king comes out there and he says, hey, that ain't your wife you're with, king. Everybody's like, shh, stop. <laughs> I think it's hilarious, man. I just love that. He's like, I'm not here to make anybody happy. Whatsoever. I'm here to serve King Jesus, and I hope it makes all y'all mad, because I don't care. <laughs> and that was John's attitude. He's like, man, I saw what y'all did to my dad. I seen what y'all did to my people. I'm living out here because I don't like people whatsoever. And now Jesus is showing up telling me that I got to baptize him. And then the spirit of the Lord fell upon him like a dove, and the voice of the Lord came upon him. All of that was the transference of all of the priestly promises given to King Jesus. Now, now he would be the king and the priest. Mm. That's just incredible to me. And then it says in verse seven, this man came for a witness to bear witness to the light that all through him might believe. Now he was not the light, but he was sent to bear witness to the light. Like the moon, we see John. John is not the light, but he reflects the light of the sun. And that's what we're supposed to do as the bride of King Jesus. And verse nine says, that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. So there it is again. Now we're only in nine verses and he keeps telling us that Jesus is the light that is no competition with darkness whatsoever. And he can't get very far without talking about it again. Oh, I gotta tell you one more time. You just have no, uh, isn't, it, isn't it amazing that John actually lived with Jesus and in all the different ways that he could have expressed Jesus to us in his gospel. He wants you to know he is holy he is God, he is the creator, he is the word, and darkness is no competition with him whatsoever. Uh, verse 10 says, he was in the world and the world was made through him <laughs> and the world did not know him. And he came to his own and his own did not receive him, but as many as did receive him to him, to them, he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. He says, you know, it didn't hit with very many people, but the ones it did hit with, they literally became the sons of God. They literally became family with the Father. I'm gonna close on this, ask guys in the band to come up here. Hey man, I got through 12 verses, kinda. Amen. Amen. We'll continue this next time. We'll start at verse 12 and we'll continue this. Um, so I, I would just say that if I was you, man, read the book of John, start off in chapter one and go through it verse by verse by verse and just stop and think about what it's actually saying. Think about why does John want you to know that? Why? And why is that important to him? And what, what conclusions do you come to? 
Now, if I was going to, in verse 3, uh, verse 13 says, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Talking about us, the sons of God. He's just saying exactly like what he said at the beginning of the creation story, at the beginning of this very book where he says, Jesus created absolutely everything simply because he wanted to. And then he says this, as many as did receive King Jesus, he gave them power to be called the sons of God. And then he said this, because he wanted to. Not because they wanted to, not because something else happened, not because of anything else, simply because that's what he wanted to do was to make you family with him. That's the book of John is just amazing. Guys, let's give Jesus a great big praise. So good. Hallelujah.